Music and Bigger Zone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be or may not be out there. A big, huge, warm welcome to this. The Quantum Kev Baker Show. Is it on? Isn't it? Time will tell. Obviously, the globe has been hit with massive Skype outages today. And, you know, when your alternative radio medium kind of depends on Skype, this could pose little problems. Now then, I'm joined tonight by my two absolutely brilliant co-hosts here in the place of no time, no space. We've got Johnny Whistles and Big Marty. Are we here, guys? Are we on? Are we we not? We are on? We're on. (laughs) Absolutely brilliant. How are you doing, Marty? Yeah, I'm doing good. Although, uh, looking at the chat, mine's reading that there's... Over 3,600 in there. <laughs> oh, holy moly, now. I don't know if it's kind of glitch, but when you scroll down, they are mostly unique names, so I don't know what's going on, and I'm definitely not reading them out. <laughs> okay, folks, we're pretty much having to think on our feet here, because right up until the last moment, we did not know if there was going to be a show or not. It truly is Schrodinger's show. And Johnny, are you there? Are you through the CERN hole? Come to me, man. I managed to get through, Kev, after a few attempts and getting absolutely nothing, but I persevered and I finally got here, Kev, and I'm looking forward to this. I don't know if we're going to have the show that we were talking about. I hope we are. So, Well, we're definitely going to have some kind of show. And Johnny, are you in the chat room? Marty, I'm in the, in chat. the chat room. Any, well, Marty's got 3,500. We can't have Marty shouting out 3,500 names, but Johnny, I'll come to you. In just a moment, I haven't actually got into the chat room yet, but obviously tonight, folks, I've made a big song and a big dance all over the internet about the fact that a man that we first had on the show back in April by the name of Anthony Patch was going to be coming on to the show tonight, could be coming on to the show tonight, still is coming on to the show tonight, we honestly do not know. Now, for any of the listeners out there, if you're not aware, I mentioned at the top of the show there, we're having Skype issues. Skype went down globally this afternoon. Now, they are slowly bringing everyone back online, but we've had serious issues trying to log in. A lot of people are just receiving the spinning wheel of death and it's timing out. And that's exactly the superposition that Anthony Patch is in right now. Is he here? Isn't he here? Is he logging in? Isn't he? He truly is Schrodinger's patch. Now, I am still working furiously in the background here, guys. Mr. Anthony Patch has given me his number to call, but we are outside of the US. Now, I'm trying to get Tony to call in. I'm going to keep the phone lines free for now for Tony to call in. Hopefully he will. I'm messaging him back as we speak. But Marty, that, I mean... What can you do here, man? You love ra- live radio, right? This is this is the kind of thing you love. <laughs> yeah, because you never know what's going to happen, do you? It's not scripted, and I know sometimes we have links and articles and stuff where we might read bits out from, but it's kind of live all the time. Uh, I think it, it doesn't sound as live because you kind of know what you're doing. <laughs> That's why I'm a co-host. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I do not know about that. But I am, right, wait a minute now, oh, pressure's on my absolute physics hero up there with Hawkins and the likes of Einstein himself, our very own Tesla, Tony Patch, is tuned in right now. And Tony, if you can, please, please, please call in on the following number, if I can find it. Where's it gone, pesky numbers? And that number is 866-37-87-884, that's... Three eight double six three seven eight seven eight eight four. And will we go to the caller on the line that is waiting just now? I bet you it's going to be CERN related. We build this as a CERN hole. Let's go through the CERN <laughs> gate and let's take a quantum caller. Why quantum? Because we just don't know how this is going to turn out, Marty. <laughs> oh, the beauty of it. The beauty of it all. A wireless caller. Wait till I see. I just need to. Unmute this caller. Stand by. We're going through the CERN hole right now. Caller, welcome to the Kev Baker Show. Are you there? 
Anybody? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. This is Anthony Patch. Hey, hey, ah. Mr. Patch. How are you doing, sir? Rumors <laughs> of your demise are definitely being exaggerated. <laughs> Absolutely. What a funny thing to see your name in print under that kind of a headline. Men in black. <laughs> and uh, Tony... Pretty weird stuff out there. Well, Tony, obviously I have to ask you, I don't know how much you're willing to go into on this, but you did come on the show back in April. We were privileged to share all that information that you had uncovered on CERN. And then you went to speak at a public event, one of Clyde Lewis's, Ground Zero Media University kind of talks. And something happened there, Tony. I don't know if you're wanting to talk about that, but I have to ask the question, what happened that day, man? <laughs> well, it was pretty low-key. Uh, short version is two gentlemen sitting in the back of the room, very obvious who they were, approached me after the event in the parking lot, they were friendly enough. Uh, they didn't shake my hand. They just said, we like what you're saying, but we'd like you to stop. And that was the sum total of the uh, conversation. And I didn't say anything back. I just simply left, and they left me alone. And that was the end of it. And, you know, being a listener... There's more to it than that, but that's the, that's the short story. Being a listener to Clyde, I mean, he also had a strange episode as well, a future event he had, and it was almost as if he had been warned off as well. Now, I don't know what part it was that was um, bringing you so much attention, Tony, but something, obviously, that you were saying at that point was worrying them, would you say? Yeah, I've tried to sit through some of the subjects that we've gone over and see where the sensitivity was uh, was struck, and... I think it really revolved mostly around the uh, quantum computer that we had talked about. And a few times we had mentioned the manufacturer's name. I think that may have led to them saying, okay, he's crossed the line here. We need to give him a warning shot. Well, tonight we shall just call it quantum computer. I know which one you're talking about. The guys know which one you're talking about. Anyone who wants to go back and check out any of our previous shows... No, no, will know which one we are talking about. But Tony, I've been trying as best as I could to try and cover this massive topic of CERN. And there's such a glut of information out there on the internet. Plus, it's hard to make head nor tail of all that information that they publicly put on their website that it is kind of hard to make sense of. And I'm sure at times I've probably hyped things that didn't need hyping. So I'm glad, so, so glad, A, that you're safe and well, and B, that you could come on here tonight to share with us what the hell is going on in Geneva. Well, it's been pretty low-key. Uh, they've been going through essentially calibration of the machine using protons. There have been some low-level, low-power collisions anywhere between 8 TeV and 13 TeV within CMS, ATLAS, and the LHCB um, detectors. But they haven't really released too much that has been earth-shaking, like the Higgs boson uh, press release that came out in 2012, 2013, the God particle. They've been talking about quark gluon condensates, what we have said on this show are really strangelets. They've talked a little bit in terms of saying, oh, we've discovered this new... Uh, composite structure, this condensate. Well, you and I have been talking about it since early this year, and in fact, it's been out in the public publications through the universities and the laboratories for about three years. And it even goes back a little further than that. But essentially, strangelets are nothing new, but it was typical with these guys, the press office. They'll put out a press release saying this is a new discovery when, in fact, it is not a new discovery. And, Tony, this so that even, kind I think, of activity this, is going on. I think they even discovered these strangelets when they breached the 10 tera electron volt barrier at the relatively heavy ion collider, which is set, situated at Brookhaven Labs. Now, folks, we will be back 
after the break. Don't go anywhere. Schrodinger's patch is back. The experiment is clapped. <laughs> he is alive and well, and he will be joining us on the other side. You are listening to the True Truth Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. To the second part of tonight's, well, it was disjointed, now it's not, Kev Baker show. We have been joined by the one and only Mr. Anthony Patch, breaking his silence here first tonight. Right here for all of you out there live on the Kev Baker Show. Now, Marty, I've just seen there you said I shouldn't hang up before the break. You're probably right. I'm waiting to see if the stream is kicked back in. Do you think we're sounding good, man? We're sounding great. Yeah, that was just me panicking. No, you're right, brother, because I remember watching Chris Geo's very informative training video, and you have called it right. I should not have hung up there. But we're back. We still have Mr. Tony Patch live. Tony, Welcome back to the show, sir. We've got a full 27 minutes here. Now, how long do we have with you tonight? As long as you care to have me, my friend. Okay, well, I am going to announce it right now. Joe Joseph is probably sitting, kicking, punching his computer. I am hijacking the Freedom Link, and we will be carrying this over because there is no way we can fit this into the next 27 minutes. Now, Tony, before the break, you were talking about Quark glue on concentrates and this is something that we have covered on the show before but we have new listeners now and these are basically strangelets now what gets me is tony at one point we were almost thinking that strangelets may well just be the public kind of woo that they were trying to distract us with but you've kind of changed your opinion on that now haven't you yeah, it does appear that uh, they are using one of the three main characteristics of strangelets, primarily its explosive potential, given that it's the most powerful explosive in the known universe. They want to employ this to rip a veil in the fabric of space. This is their mechanism to open up that portal that they have been very open about to another dimension. And later on after that, and this is pretty strange to even say, but their ultimate goal is to kill God. So they will use it as a weapon against God and his forces, or so they think. And through that CERN hole, Stargate, Rift, whatever name you want to put on it, they intend to bring interdimensional beings to this plane. And that's something that we are going to get into as we progress as well. But, Tony, these strangelets, these are the kind of things that when CERN was talking about carrying out these behemoth collisions, people, even in the mainstream, were saying, well, hold on a minute, this has the potential to maybe be a black hole and gobble up the planet. Is there any truth to that, or is that actually, potentially, a likelihood? Well, I think we have a larger issue than we do with black holes, and that goes back to the strangelets. And the use of that as an explosive, I think it does have the ability to alter the fabric of of space at a very small microscopic level. And once that occurs, then you can have this widening of that very small opening that they create and that will be controlled by the computer, the quantum computer that we're not naming. But that will create a ever-widening rift, and they will have a limit to that. It'll be limited in size, but they'll stabilize that rift and establish a permanent inter- interdimensional connection through which these entities will travel through. So black holes are a holdover from the Big Bang Theory. And the Big Bang Theory encompasses Einstein's theory of relativity. Black holes are theoretical. They've never been proven mathematically or experimentally, meaning physically proven. You can't measure it. You can't reproduce it in the laboratory. Therefore, it does not exist. So black holes are theoretical. And I know that Stephen Hawking has put out you know, his concern about the creation of black holes. But to date... They've never been detected nor proven. And as much as he is my hero, he does have a vested interest in the existence of black holes because 
he's basically created his whole career around that theory, hasn't he? He has, and of late what he's moved into is very much akin to what I'm describing as this rift in the dimension in the fabric of space. He calls it the vacuum. He's moved beyond the black hole scenario into the opening up of a small vacuum that will continue at the speed of light to increase in size and virtually instantaneously beyond our level of comprehension or detection it will essentially suck up the universe into another dimension through this vacuum that he postulates. So he's moved beyond the black hole into a vacuum scenario, which I also call the opening of the interdimensional rift. And I hope a lot of people didn't lose their brains out of a vacuum in the side of their head there. But Tony, one of the things we were harping on about at the time when we first got you on and we called on your knowledge of this physics was the fact we were pointing to right now, September time. Now, I'd love it if you could just spend a couple of moments explaining for the listeners what's going on just now and how that differs from, say, December, when the real explosions get underway. Well, that's great. Good question. Right now, what they're doing essentially are colliding protons. These are relatively lightweight um, particles. Some people like to say they're smashing rocks together. And that's producing anywhere from 8 to 13 TeV. And that's really for calibration. They're moving into cleaning or scrubbing of the main ring where these particles are traveling so that they can then Uh, bring in ions of lead. They're moving from colliding protons together. They're going to be colliding small particles of lead, which, of course, are much denser. And because of that higher density and its higher resting mass, which they then increase by 14,000 times with moving those ions to near the speed of light, they are going to generate significantly higher levels of energy during these collisions and also a higher production rate of strangelets. Wow. And, of course, we've seen the bunches tightening at CERN. And this is something that we hear a lot from people like myself and a few of the other YouTubers out there. But what does that actually mean, Anthony, when they're packing the bunches closer and closer together, just for the audience so they can get some kind of idea in their mind. And I know this is kind of old information, but I know from messages I've been receiving, there's new people coming to this. They're worried about this. And I'm just hoping we can bring a bit of clarity before we move into the really, really dark side of what is going on here, in my opinion. Okay. Well, before I step into that, I want to just finish the last comment about the movement into the use of ions of lead. Everyone appreciates having a date or a time frame. So on the 16th of November, they will stop using protons. And during the 16th, 17th, and 18th of November, they will begin setting up for the introduction of the ions of lead. The ion collisions of lead will take place between November 19th in December 13th, and then they will shut down the machine on the 14th. So what we're looking at here is higher levels of energy during that time frame. And in order to achieve those higher levels of energy, not only do you have denser particles, now lead, but you are bringing billions of ions together, and they do call them bunches, as you say, into tight configurations, what they call luminosity, and they are bringing these bunches together consisting of billions of pieces of lead, but each of those bunches are also separated by a space. They have been, during the year, the protons separated by 50 nanoseconds of time. So understand that the bunches are moving at near the speed of light. Each group of bunches is separated in time and space by a distance of measured as 50 nanoseconds of time as the bunches pass by, a fixed point. So, Tony, basically what you're describing there is like a stream of 
almost like balls just constantly we can't actually differentiate that smaller space of time it's almost like a constant explosion would it not uh, well i like to say it's like a pencil lead that is rather than a stream of separated beams it is now a solid stream of lead moving at the speed of light now separated not by 50 nanoseconds of time, but 25 nanoseconds of time. When you get to that level of compactness, using the kilometers to pull and increase the luminosity, the density of this, you have two oppositely circulating solid lead streams. You now have essentially rings, two rings of lead moving in opposite directions at near the speed of light at certain points called detectors, they will cross those solid streams and cause a massive collision and explosion. We spoke before, Tony. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm muted up there. We spoke before about how this could relate to something like Saturn. Now, I'm picturing this, Tony. I'm looking at these two massive rings, 17 mile rings, I believe. And with what you're describing to me, it's almost like a recreation of those solid rings we see around Saturn. Very much so. Very much so. Uh, those rings around Saturn are the result of what is known as synchrotron energy that radiates outward at a 90-degree angle out perpendicular from um, a strong magnetic source. And a strong magnetic source moving particles at near the speed of light generate synchrotron energies, and those result in the rings around as well as around the synchrotron or the particle accelerator at CERN. Oh, wow. And now, Tony, just before we move back on to anything, it's not like you're some kind of um, prophetic kind of guy. All of this is out there, and even down to when they have these, what sometimes seems like scary mega kind of dramatized dumping of the beams. All of this is there, and mm -hmm. it's all on their schedules. Could you tell people where to find that? And I'll go dig it up and drop it in the chat for them, and I'll include it on the links. Yeah, actually, uh, if you just simply go into your favorite search engine and type in LHC Schedule 2015, it will be at the top of the search list, and you can also search for one that is called the Injector, I-N-J-E-C-T-O-R, Injector Schedule 2015, LHC, and it'll pop right up in the search engines. And you can go to the PDFs and see that, or you can go to my website at anthonypatch.com and go to Schedules tab on my homepage, and you'll see them right there. And those are PDFs that you can download. And you heard that there, folks. You can check out this man's brilliant website at www.anthonypatch.com. Marty's just gone and dug up a uh, schedule there. i done it on the Google as well. We'll drop that in the chat for everyone. But this is something that you can refer to. Even if you see one of these videos popping up saying red alert, scary alert, all these things that happen, you can go to this. And there was one occasion I remember that I just looked at this and it was absolutely perfectly timed. But when you looked at all the videos on YouTube, Tony, oh, wow, people were going nuts over this. Yeah, and that's the thing that I think you and I are trying to do. We're trying to render a service here to reduce the fear and reduce the hype because... A lot of misinformation is being put out there, and you do your research. You are one of the very few people that I speak with on the radio and on the Internet that really does his homework and really does understand the science beyond just looking at a few pages. So I commend you and the other guys because we are able to put some clarity to this, and that's really our mission is clarity results in a lack of fear. And one thing I do like as well, Tony, is by the end of tonight, you're going to connect all of the dots. Even if we don't name the thing, we are going to go into the subject that ties all of this together. But before we get there, we'll go into all of that good stuff after the break. But what's been happening during your brief hiatus there, Tony? Have you been researching more 
on what's going on? Have you formulated new ideas contrary to what you had before? Oh, most definitely. And uh, one specific is to the opening of the abyss, Apollo's uh, temple, Apollyon, and the connection of CERN to the opening of the abyss and where that's located. Oh, I can't leave it there. Where, where, where is this abyss? Where is this located, Tony? Well, I was giving you a lead-in in case you were taking a break here, but yes, yeah, CERN is located at the ancient Roman site of the temple to the sun god Apollo, Apollyon, and it is has been believed for many, many years, for thousands of years, that that is the location of the abyss. CERN is the key to the abyss. CERN, in opening an interdimensional portal, physically will be providing access to the abyss, which is the center of the Earth. And that is also connected to the prison planet that we've talked about before, and you mentioned a moment ago, and that's Saturn. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Now, obviously, this is not the public face of CERN, guys, and I want to bring in Marty and Johnny Whistles here. Marty, thankfully, I took your advice. We went to the caller. We have our guest now, but we've laid out a lot of what we've heard before, and I think that's good for the new listeners out there. But what do you make of this so far, Marty? I bet your head is buzzing. No, no, not at all. Uh, really, really good information there. I'm looking at the schedule. Thanks for sharing the the uh, link to get to that one, Tony. Uh, but I can see this ion thing going on in December. So everybody's panicking about September, maybe December, just saying. <laughs> Johnny Whistles, what do you think, man? Yeah, because... December. On you go, yeah. Tony. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Johnny, what do you think? Because we have been pointing to September, a lot of us, like Marty said there. But here we go, already tonight, we've kind of dispelled what is already a full month of woo. We've taken that part out. And now we know when we should be looking for these big explosions. But, Johnny, you've been watching stuff all day, and I'm sure you've got a question for Mr. Patch. Uh, it's actually the thing I was watching about, it was up quarks and down quarks, and then there's some other kind of quark that muddles it all together, and you get strangelets. <laughs> Now, the thing is, I was looking at the danger of strangelets. Would that be quite possible from CERN as well? Right. Uh, the quark gluon condensate, strangelets, is made up of up and down, and what are also, and this is where the name comes from, strange quarks. These are groups of quarks that are held together by a substance that they want to call, or a force not necessarily a substance, but a force called gluon that literally binds these quarks together. And when they're brought together, they do behave, as I've said before, like a cousin to the black hole, the theoretical black hole. Strangelets, however, are not theoretical. And they do have mass. They, do, they are as dense as a black hole in that they pass right through the Earth and stop at the core of the planet, due to our own gravity at the core, they're stopped. At that point, they begin to attract matter, and they begin to replicate. And that's what converts a planet such as ours to a neutron star. Wow. Yeah, and something else I've seen in CERN's official documents was stating that the chances of creating strangelets are actually 65 to 70 percent, according to their own documents. But they don't exist, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, Tony, do you think with this uh, ion collision in December, is that something that could actually produce strangelets itself? Most definitely, and that's one of the reasons for this, the twofold reason being the dimensional aspects we spoke of, but the other is to produce this explosive so that they can open up the rift, but they can also use it as a weapon. So when we were talking about the relative relativistic heavy ion collider, the RHIC at Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York, 
back in April of last year, they produced a paper that was published in August that stipulated that 10 tera electron volts was the threshold at which strangelets are produced. And they produced them at, at, in small quantities at Brookhaven. We're well beyond the threshold of 10. We've been at 13 since March of this year consistently. And we'll go to 14 and perhaps a little more in December. So certainly strangelets are part of this picture. Now, Tony, even when we hear about them dumping the beams and ramping down and things like that, can that have any effect at all? What happens when they dump these beams going at near the speed of light? Well, they uh, collide with a target that's composed of um, primarily uh, heavy, dense steel and concrete and a couple of other layers of other dense material. And interestingly, this is what they call the north area. And you'll see that on the chart and on the schedule, north area. That's the center point of the main ring. That's located 300 feet below a public roadway, specifically a traffic circle. So they're sending all that energy to a point 300 feet below people's feet, pedestrian traffic and cars. It impacts, it gets absorbed, and it gives off radiation, but it's not a big issue for the public. And that's the kind of thing that has led to people theorizing, myself included, not only that, but the power of the magnets themselves may be enhancing or adding to earth changes that we're seeing right now. And that is how I first came across you, Tony, when you were on with Clyde talking about CERN and possibly the fact that it, the production of gravimetric waves could be having a measurable effect on the planet i.e. earthquakes. Now, we had an 8 plus in Nepal at a time when CERN was on. And again, we've recently just had an 8 plus near Chile when CERN was on. Anything to be concerned about? Most definitely. Um, these are not what are known as antipodal or directly opposite locations on the planet, CERN and Chile. But... It's close enough. And yes, gravimetric waves, these are gravity waves that are the result of strong magnetic fields, specifically the superconducting magnets and the magnetic fields that are generated by the movement of the particles that we're talking about at near the speed of light also create strong magnetic fields. And definitely these fields are propagating. They're moving like waves of energy through the crust and the mantle of the planet, and it will strike and affect a weak point in the crust, typically on the opposite side of the planet, such as Chile. I think there's a direct correlation between the activities of CERN and volcanoes and earthquake activity. It definitely seems to me that it's a no-brainer, guys, and I'll bring in whistles at this point, and I'll get your thoughts as well, Marty. But... When you're talking about a machine like this, switching it on and earthquakes kicking off, not once, not twice, but there's almost a correlation now. We can see some kind of pattern almost here. It's something we really need to set up and take note of, Johnny. And yet here they are. They're all going to the UN. They're going to be moaning about fossil fuels and me and you exhaling CO2 and killing the planet. Surely something like CERN is a more pressing matter. But that's just my opinion. What do you think? Yeah. Well, we'd be arguing about something that plants actually like, which is CO2. But this uh, certain thing, Kev, I, I've always thought that when it's been ramped up, we're seeing a lot of activity. We've got volcanoes going off all over the place. We've got earthquakes. That one that was uh, in Chile, now, we had looked at a chart where it, was, it started off as a tiny quake in Canada and you could see it coming all the way down like a massive shockwave all the way to Chile where they had an 8.3. And I don't know if that has anything to do with um, what CERN cared, but when CERN was ramped up to its highest 
at that point because somebody had posted it in the chat earlier on. So it must have something to do with these things, Kev. And even if we can't definitely prove it, Marty, we have to at least put it out there. We're almost going to the break, and after the break, we're going to be getting into what controls all of this. What is at the heart of all of this? But Marty, you were the one that dug up the 100,000 times the strength of the magnetic field of the Earth. We're seeing these earthquakes, man. Tony seems to think there may be correlation. Any further thoughts? Yeah, well, me too, to be honest. I was just checking that link again, and that is actually from CERN's own website, and they say that the main dipoles generate powerful 8.4 Tesla magnetic fields, equivalent to, like you were saying, more than 100 times that of Earth's magnetic field. And uh, they're also talking about being one step closer to the 11 Tesla dipole magnet. So just keep pushing the bar up there. And then there was talk a couple of years ago of a test one at 13.5. So, I mean, these guys are never happy and they just keep pushing the bar. Um, It's like playing Russian roulette with physics kind of thing. I don't know if Tony can agree with that in the next segment of the show. But I think for any new listeners interested in this kind of stuff, go back and check the archives and the YouTube playlist and uh, for you know for other shows we've done with Tony because there is just so much information in this um, yeah go back from the beginning <laughs> and we're about to go through the CERN hole for another part of KBS on the other side we're hijacking the freedom link don't go anywhere see you through the CERN gate this is the Truth Frequency Radio Network we are TFR Truth Frequency Radio. Thankfully, this isn't Joe Joseph from the Freedom Link. I have hijacked his show. I'm only joking, guys. A big, big shout out to Joe Joseph and his co host, the wizard, Johnny King, for agreeing to let me hijack the next two hours. Because Joe is having such severe Skype problems anyway, this is a good thing this has happened, guys, because thankfully, Mr. Patch has kindly agreed to spend the time with us and it would have been a rebroadcast joe would have had yet another excuse on how to rebroadcast and why to rebroadcast and he just doesn't need that so listen let's not waste any more time tonight the kbs crew are live here it is the 22nd of september in the uk 21st over the pond and we are on the freedom link and we are joined by our good friend and the expert on cern and so much more Mr. Anthony Patch. Now you can check out Anthony's work at www.anthonypatch.com and I urge you all to do that. But before you do that, Tony, during the break, welcome back, sir, you were talking more about these gravimetric waves. Would you like to share that with the audience? Yeah, the gravimetric waves are gravity waves that move through the planet and they're the result of natural as well as man-made, in this case CERN, um, magnetic fields. And the planet has its own inherent magnetic fields, but CERN is creating their own, and you can actually physically, with the proper instruments, see the waves moving through solid stone, through the solid crust of the Earth. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute. Sorry, Tony. Have we been joined by the one and only... Uh, I think we've got him. I think. Oh no, he's come back to hijack his own show. Um, Tony. Oh no, the man, the myth, Joe Joseph. I don't know what you're talking about. No, no, man. I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the bat phone. I just wanted to let you know it's still spinning. Oh, I thought you were away to make your own podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, and, I, and I'm formulating my own. Yeah, I'm going to start my own podcast now because you know, since since it's more like Kev's Freedom Link, so it's all good, man. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you want to say a quick hello to Tony, Joe. Oh, Tony, man, it's so good to to have you back. It's awesome. I'm glad that you're you're doing this for for us tonight, and I'll be listening in. I won't be able to participate too much, but I'll, at least I'll be able to listen in and hear what you got to say. So, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on tonight. Yeah, thanks for your generosity and letting me hijack your show along with Kev. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. The, it's like the Wonder Twins, only it's like the Quantum Twins. <laughs> We're entangled all the way across the pond, separated by time and space, but only on this plane, Joe. And I advise you take a pen, you listen to how KBS do the next two hours, because this is the way forward for you, Joe. It truly is. So, Tony, 
let's get back to you. Let's get into this. Gravimetric waves, what is going on here? Yeah, you know, we were talking a bit earlier about uh, correlating the Chile earthquake at 8.3 to activities at CERN. And I took a look at the hard numbers, the uh, the uh, actual time frame that collisions were taking place at CERN. And the collisions at CERN took place four hours after the earthquake. But that doesn't discount it. It's the ramping up of the machine. It's the accelerating of the particles that causes these gravimetric waves to be produced in the first place, not necessarily just the collision. So still, there's a correlation between what they're doing and these earthquakes. And Tony, is it the actual magnets, the ring itself, or is it the spinning of something at close to the speed of light, which in itself produces an electromagnetic field? Is that where the production of these is coming from? That's correct. Uh, you have a certain level, but you, from the inherent gravimetric forces, or gravity forces, gravity waves that are produced by the superconducting magnets, but they only reach out so far. They do have the ability to reach out and affect the magnetosphere, which is much more sensitive to magnetic lines of force that come from the supermagnets. But correctly, yes. The spinning at near the speed of light of particles induces a magnetic field perpendicular to the direction that those particles are moving, and those are what are propagating or moving in waves through the planet. They're much stronger than the superconducting magnets themselves. And, you know, we're talking magnets here, and I'm wondering, I'm going to ask you, but just recently, we've seen a very amazing phenomenon right across the world almost, Tony. And that was the auroras at night. Instead of their usual green hue, these had an ominous red glow to them. Now, when we're talking big magnets that are stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, could this be playing some effect on it? Could that be a result of CERN? And I know we're speculating here. But I'm just trying to think maybe some other symptoms we can see from this machine. Well, certainly, if you have magnetic lines of force that are moving out into our magnetosphere, which essentially are the shields around the planet, protecting us from incoming X-rays and gamma rays from outside the planet, then if you distort the shields and, in fact, tear holes in the, in the field, you're allowing more X-rays, gamma rays, and also accelerated protons coming from the sun to penetrate the shields, and that's what induces the auroras that you see. And, in fact, I'm here in Oregon. I'm in Portland, Oregon. We sometimes will see the auroras down here, but just recently we saw them well south of Portland, and they were magnificent. They were green, not red this time, but in such intensity that we have never experienced here before. And these red ones, although you haven't seen them yourself, we had Sonia down under. She was sending me pictures of things that were seen down there. And this is a global phenomenon. Now, we're going to start getting into the real meat of the pudding here because... Right at the heart of all of what is going on, we've been talking strangelets, speed of light collisions, gravimetric waves, ripping holes in space and time. How the heck do they control all of this? Well, there's something very, very, very powerful at the heart of everything. And Tony, I believe, and it's just my thoughts here, this might be the subject that brought you the attention of the MIBs. The men in black. Yep, those mythological creatures that ain't so mythological. And I think it's this subject here that brings the heat. Now, we've agreed not to name the machine in question, but we are going to call it the quantum computer. Tony, how does a quantum computer relate to everything that we've been talking about so far? Well, we have a machine that is not based on transistors. It's based on qubits. And it operates essentially by putting a 
problem, an equation, into another dimension at the quantum level and extracting the solution from that other dimension and returning it here. That's at the quantum level. Its application, as I said earlier on your show, is multiple applications, but specific to CERN, it's for controlling this opening of the portal. It has a lot of other applications to it, but it already operates interdimensionally. And that is what makes it a quantum computer in the first place. And for listeners out there wondering, well, what the heck is this quantum computing all about? We're used to dealing with bits. Well, when it comes to quantum world, we deal with qubits, quantum bits. And this all involves nano diamonds and spinning electrons. Now, that's enough to give you an idea, but when we're talking interdimensional quantum, here is the kicker. They realized at some point when they were making transistors smaller, 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 that something very strange, something happening. And it was something called quantum effects. But instead of it putting them off, going further and smaller and things, no, no, no. They thought, well, how do we actually utilize this? And this is where the strange stuff really starts to happen. Because that bit in the computer that you're listening to this on is a one or a zero. But when we add in some quantum strangeness via a spinning electron, what happens is we can have a one, a zero, all at the same time, and it is called something, sorry, it is called superposition. Now, this is where the whole kind of thing you have, myself and Joe and the guys, all having a laugh about quantum strangeness. Is it here? Isn't it here? You have to observe it. You've heard us talking about this, and this is the quantum aspect of it. They don't want to observe that, because while it's in that one and zero state and infinite potentials and possibilities. That's what they utilize to carry out all these calculations and computations at such a speed. But who am I to talk about this? Tony, have I kind of roughly said where we're going with the quantum bit? Absolutely. Again, you're well read and we've talked about this before in more detail and you're analogies and explanations have always been spot on, even when we got really deep with it. We are looking at ones and zeros, a binary. But in this situation, as you have said before on other shows, it's where you have supersymmetry and superposition, whereby a zero can be a one and a one can be a zero, but a one can be a one and a zero can be a zero. That's a four-way positioning of information, digital information. This is where the word qubit comes in. You have a cubing, a four-way processing of digital information that is occurring simultaneously. So the zeros, at the same time that they're a zero, they're also a one, and so forth, into a four-way representation. And this all ties in with information that we've been sharing when we've had the likes of Nano Girl on with us as well, Marty, because we were talking about artificial intelligence and stuff like that. And I imagine that the Jade system we spoke about would utilize a very machine like we are speaking about. But this quantum stuff, I've had the nickname now Quantum Kev. I'm sure the more you look at it, the stranger it gets. But you were mentioning a little experiment in the chat there. What was that about? Well, that was actually the double slit experiment, which uh, <laughs> I believe there's a Nobel piece. Oh, sorry, Nobel piece, Nobel Prize waiting for anybody that can actually explain it, any kind of physicist or anything. And that was the experiment that they did uh, on the particles being kind of self-aware and kind of knowing that they were being monitored and stuff. Absolutely fascinating. Go and check that one out, guys. There's plenty of videos on YouTube about it, the double slit experiment. I'd like to get Tony's take on it because I am seeing all kinds of stuff about the double slit experiment and quantum entanglement. Um, And I just wanted to know if he thinks that's tied into the quantum measurement and the qubits and stuff. Sure, absolutely. They go hand in hand. Uh, Quantum entanglement essentially means that you can have two particles 
separated by an infinite distance. So imagine us causing an effect on a particle here on the planet Earth. And millions of light years away, there's an identical particle that is quantum entangled. It is linked. And when we stimulate or affect a particle here, we're doing it at the opposite end of the universe in a similar or identical fashion. That's quantum entanglement and it's symmetry. And we can go into the dance of symmetry at CERN that they put together. But symmetry and quantum entanglement essentially mean that you have things that can be affected at a distance. And Einstein postulated this, and it's been proven in the laboratory to be viable and re reproducible and measurable. So you have the opportunity with this quantum computer to, as I said euphemistically, place in another dimension a combinatorial pro problem and an equation that needs to be solved. And you're putting in every possible solution simultaneously into another dimension at a quantum level. And you're affecting it through supersymmetry due to quantum entanglement. The slit, as you're talking about, relates very briefly. It relates to if you observe something, you affect it. And if you affect it, you're affecting it at the quantum level because you are connected to it as an observer. Therefore, through quantum entanglement, you have an effect on something just by observing it. You change its dynamics. You change its qualities. And yeah. that's why I'm glad, Marty, we were able to measure Anthony tonight via the audio of Skype and collapse him into our reality. <laughs> yeah, just to tie off what Tony was saying there, just by observing something, you can actually change it. Well, maybe there's stuff out there that they shouldn't observe. <laughs> it's we might all just uh, poof. And you know, Marty, Johnny, I see you're wanting in here, but Tony, I want to thank you, right, because I was smiling to myself the other day. Everyone knows I'm a geek. I buy the new scientist, and I'm sitting reading about an experiment, and it was all about quantum strangeness. And, you know, Einstein used to call this sort of thing spooky action at a distance. And there's a couple of things that troubled physicists, even to just recently, about this quantum entanglement. There was something called the locality loophole, where they said that basically these spinning electrons could actually already be entangled before the experiment ever exists, and they're having some kind of effect on each other, which renders everything useless because it doesn't prove that if something was the other end of the universe that it would react at exactly the same time but while i was reading this tony i'm sitting reading about an experiment in holland where they took two nano diamonds with electrons inside and i smiled because thanks to you i knew that they were talking about just what we're talking about here which is qubits and what they've done is they beamed <laughs> microwaves through them from a far enough away location to rule out the locality loophole. And there was another loophole in there, but they got round that. And once and for all, they have proved that quantum entanglement is no longer a theory. It does exist. That's true. And they've also been able to teleport in a similar fashion of what you're talking about, to teleport a series of molecules across the laboratory at a distance. I think the maximum distance now is 30 meters, but they've actually been able to teleport, just like in, in Star Trek. Wow. And it is using nano diamonds. <laughs> you see, it's only thanks to you that I was able to pick up on that. And the reason I say that, it's not only selfish in my part, but these listeners out there, you can all learn from this information and the reason I like going to Tony is because he's able to put it across in a way that is understandable to somebody who's got the most basic understanding of this stuff. And that is important because, like Tony said when he first came on, we want to remove a lot of the hype. And I hold my hands up, guys, because while my mentor has been away, I have been probably just as guilty of as anyone else of adding to that. And I apologize but that's why I've tried, and myself, Marty and Johnny, have tried to set the record straight here so far tonight.
by bringing back Mr. Patch. Now, before we get back into this, Johnny, I see you, the man, the myth. You have a question. Yeah, it's actually something that's it's really amazed me since this thing, well, when I first heard about it, is the fact that something isn't there until you, uh, you actually observe it. But the thing is, how does it know that you are observing it or what triggers that what triggers that knowing that you are actually looking at it? Oh, that's, right. that's true. The theory is that we are all linked. All matter and all people, all substances are at the quantum level. We are quantum entangled. You cannot separate physical matter because there is, we've discussed the electric universe theory versus the gravity theory. The gravity theory of the universe is what mainstream science continues to promote. The real answer is that we are electrically connected. If you want to talk about quantum entanglement, it's down at the level of electrons and even deeper than that because electrons are fairly large when we're talking about the quantum scale, when we get into quarks and muons and gluons and all of that, that's smaller than electrons. But the simple way to say it is electrically, everybody is connected. Therefore, if you observe something, you can change its its charge state. Charge state means if I'm positively charged and an object next to me is negatively charged, then I can change by my presence, it's charged to a positive or attract it, either or. So the observation is defined as an electrical connection that is affecting the charge of what you're looking at. Hmm. It's is, it is amazing, honestly. It's fascinating. Big Marty. Yeah, well, I was just reading something there. It's the, the quantum mind or quantum consciousness hypothesis and that proposes that classic, uh, classical mechanics cannot explain consciousness. It uh, posits that quantum mechanical phenomena, such as quantum entanglement and superposition, may play an important role uh, in the brain's function and could actually form the basis and explanation of consciousness itself. So that just takes everything to a whole new level. It is a hypothesis or a, a collection of hypotheses, but it, is, uh, it does make you wonder when you see all the stuff that suggests that. Yeah, and our consciousness is a mixture of the physical, the electrochemical processes that take place at the neuron and synapse levels in our brains, but it's also a mixture of our spirit. And we have said on this show many times, you cannot separate the physical world from the spiritual world. And our consciousness is a mixture of both of those worlds. And that's why they're yet to come up with some grand unified theory that actually marries up the massive, the universal scale, the planets, with that of what we're talking tonight, the quantum, down at the quarks, gluon, god particle level. Now, what really has always fascinated me, Tony, since we started talking about this, is we brought up the qubit there, how it's almost interdimensional in itself and must be for it to have quantum aspects. When we talk about CERN, we talk about piercing the veil, not even just us. Their language comes from them in their year of light. So there they are too, talking about through the veil in another dimension. Now, how or how do you speculate this machine is going to utilize these explosions that occur come December at CERN? Well, the explosions will be very tightly focused as a function of the tight focusing or luminosity of the beams themselves. And these are down to, in the collimators that compress these beams, down to essentially what we have said, solid streams like a lead pencil, solid streams of particles now circulating in the beams. When they cross those solid streams, they cause an explosion to take place due to the collision of these particles within the detectors. 
And the one that I like to focus on is the ALICE detector because that's where the strain splits predominantly are produced. They can be produced in the other detectors, of course, but the ALICE detector primarily is set up for the production and detection and, and controlling, if they can, of the strain splits. But these are microscopic explosions that only exist for what they measure in is picoseconds, which is less than a nanosecond. However, that's all they need to start it. And we go back to what I said with Mr. Stephen Hawking about the vacuum. Once you are able to actually neutralize the atomic bonds between quantum particles, once you're able to slice through the atomic bonds, you then have the ability to physically enter into another dimension and that will continue to widen, and that's where this quantum computer plays a role in controlling that spread. And Tony, but we're it's almost a very, very small. We're almost going out to the break, but, and you know, I think they may have already proven or pierced the veil, and I say that because of the statements of Albert de Roque and that mysterious, unidentified line object, and the fact that he said in a quantum quirk of nature that he was going to keep an eye on it or they were going to keep an eye on it I speculate that possibly they proved they had proven or pierced the veil when they came out with that. What, what's your take on that now that time's gone on? Yeah, I still think it was just a piece of debris it could very well have been something that entered from another dimension but I don't think they reached the power levels and they didn't have sufficient quantities of strange lets to really pierce the veil as we're describing. I think it was just a piece of debris. And again, we're talking about something that's very microscopic, very small. It really had no effect. And they burned through it with a high amperage electrical bur uh, burst through the, the, they call it a pipe or one of the tubes in the ring. And we'll and be coming back just after these short messages don't go in. This is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones obviously under heavy, heavy Masonic influence. <laughs> to tonight's edition of The Freedom Link with me, your host, Kev Baker. And tonight I am joined by Big Marty. We have hijacked The Freedom Link. And Marty, I think I made a critical error during the break there. I think I hung up on our guest. <laughs> yeah, you reconnected. Nope, the I'm here. Oh, he's back, back with us. Thank goodness for that, Tony. My apologies. I did not mean to send you into the land of the Cubits, where we do not know what happens. I, I, it's just me. I'm just a crap host. I press the wrong buttons. I say the wrong <laughs> things. I don't know what's going here at the best of times. Marty, we've lost Johnny Whistles. He has slipped through the Stargate. What's going on here, man? But no, this is brilliant, brilliant stuff. Are you enjoying this so far, Marty? Oh, definitely. It is really good stuff. I do see we have another caller on the line, but of course we have a guest with us, so I'm not sure if that's Joe or somebody trying to call in. If it is, let us know in text and we'll, we'll bring you in. Excellent stuff. Now, during the break, we were talking about something that has set the internet alight with theories, talk, speculation, ever since we first seen it. Now, that is, of course, the video that CERN released. Not some conspiracy site, not some woo site, not even me, but yep, CERN themselves. And that video is called Symmetry. And Tony, that video, we could talk about that probably for a full three-hour show, but I'd love you to share with the listeners what you were telling us during the break. Yeah, it's very interesting. If you go to that video symmetry produced by CERN, it, it's a it's a ceremonial video. They're talking to the other side. They're performing occult rituals. But that's the short version. One of the things I'd like to point out is about two minutes into that video, they show some drawings of geometric shapes and one starts out as a single tetrahedron, looks like a pyramid, and then moves to the right in a series of more complex assemblies of tetrahedrons into what appears to be coming, evolving into a globe or a sphere comprised of tetrahedrons. Now, the reason that I find that significant is on a personal level. In my book, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough, 
I put forth the model of the universe as being a sphere, a globe that is comprised of tetrahedrons. And the computers in my storyline, two of them, are globes that are comprised of 600 cells of tetrahedrons. So when I saw this on symmetry, I said, hmm, there's a quantum connection for you there. There's There's something going on. And there's another quantum connection for me as well, because talking of symmetry, as above, so below, and in your model of this, if we take that down to the micro scale here on the planet, look at the natural energy grid that flows across the globe that we are able to tap into at these various ley line points, something that even the ancients were able to tap into at their megalithic sites to utilise this kind of energy that Tony and these physicists at CERN are talking about. And, you know, it just amazes me, Tony, that when you lay these grids out, you do get correlations between what you see above and what you see here on the planet. And that's exactly the kind of thing that CERN are trying to utilise, isn't it? It is, and you're illustrating a very good point here, and that is there are two separate layers of public relations going on with CERN. CERN will talk about in public things that are associated with Einstein and Einstein's gravity model of the universe. And I mentioned a few minutes ago the electric model, which we can assign to, if you need to, to Tesla. So you have two different camps as to the theory of how the universe is put together and what its um, processes are. The hidden process that is fully utilized at CERN but never acknowledged in public is the electric model of the universe. And we've had long discussions about that, but I'm making it very brief here that CERN will talk about gravity and the Big Bang, and they know full well the Big Bang is nothing. It's, It's... Theoretical, they can't even prove it, but they put that out for public consumption. And you know, at the same time, the public should be aware of this, Tony, because we should know. Any time they make a fanfare and a song and dance (laughs) symmetry about anything, we know that the real truth is hidden, occulted, well, well away in the black projects, far from the prying eyes of us in the public. You got it. Absolutely, they do. And the dance of symmetry was illustrating the electric universe and the occult spiritual world that they know you can't separate spiritual and physical. And so they are practicing the spiritual, which happens to be occult spiritual practices. That's what they're employing. And they're drawing their information from the spiritual world that they're using to build this machine and have built this machine. And you know, Tony, when you look at that video, and for anyone out there, maybe it's just me, but you see the black and the white, the dark and the light, having this dance circling one another. And this, 2015, the year of light at CERN, it's almost as if they are using the light at that speed of light to call forth the dark side, to open up the hole to the abyss. It's the ultimate hijacking of the light. Or Joda. Oh, my word. Whoa, he's through the turn hole. Joda. <laughs> Schrodinger's Joe. <laughs> oh, wow. I preferred it when you were in that superposition state. You were a man of mystery, Joe. <laughs> An enigma, if you will. Well, thank you for joining us on this timeline, uh, 2015, no, where I am. My, um, m- my brain is thoroughly poured out of my ear, so I- I'm going to go back to doing what I was doing, which was listening, because you- you've got me captivated. So keep going, Kev. Well, again, I have to thank you, and this is in the true spirit and ethos of EFR, where we all pull together teamwork. KBS is the Freedom Link, is TFR, is everything. We are all one big team here, and one vital part when it comes to this CERN information is Mr. Anthony Patch. He is back with us live tonight, www.anthonypatch.com. Now, Anthony, Anthony, we're talking about symmetry there. And we're starting to get into the more esoteric, metaphysical side of what the hell is going on in reality, as opposed to this particle accelerator that they like to talk about in the mainstream. 
Now we're talking about opening interdimensional rifts. We're talking about this dark death satanic cult ruling this planet. What is the end goal of opening up and maintaining a portal to, as you described it, the abyss? Now, the CERN is located over the ancient Roman temple to the sun god Apollo or Apollyon. And it has been described for thousands of years as the location for the application of the key to open the bottomless pit. It's the portal. It's the opening where CERN is located. is directly over the opening to the abyss. They wish to call forth those spirits that they're communing with and that they're performing rituals such as the video, the dance of symmetry, too. And people all, you know, they're well aware, just as you and I are, that there is evil and there is evil, there are evil entities in our dimension and other dimensions. They're going to open this up using a physical machine to allow those demonic spirits to enter into our realm and we can go into where those spirits are going to go in a moment, because I know you want to go there. I but really do. they're also do. connecting to the planet Saturn. Let's just concentrate with this Saturn thing first, because this is, of course, very, very related to the occult and the people that we are talking about. We see their worship for what is their sun, basically. They see that as the second sun. There's a Saturnalian brotherhood at work, before we get to what may or may not be coming through there, Tony, just a quick brief word about this Saturn and why it is, it is so revered in the dark circles. Well, the stories revolve around Saturn being a prison planet which has imprisoned demonic entities and, if you will, fallen angels. And it is their goal to unlock that prison and allow those entities to join with those that reside within the abyss, within our planet. And it sounds far-fetched, but this is their belief. And we've gone through before talking about the connection of CERN to the southern pole of Saturn, and the spiral there, the replication at the north pole of the Large Hadron Collider at the north pole of Saturn, the identical machine on a much larger scale, exists at the North Pole of Saturn. They wish to connect the Southern Pole of Saturn to the Earth electrically using Birkeland currents through a toroidal field, a magnetic donut, so that they can transport these entities from Saturn back to the Earth. Those are fallen angels. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating, Tony. And we also have a little bit of a Hollywood reference to this in the Tom Hanks movie, Angels and Demons. At the beginning there, you see the CERN uh, place and the whole LHC operation. And you see something that's been created, some kind of strange little black, mini black hole type thing, and one stolen, and it turns out it's a plot by the Illuminati to bring back these demons and and you know, interact with this antimatter and stuff. And isn't it funny that this is the kind of stuff that we're actually seeing right now? So uh, while you're putting that into the, the minds of the masses that it's just fantasy, this stuff is actually going on. Yes, antimatter, uh, it's a little bit different than the strange list we spoke of a little bit earlier, but antimatter exists in very, very, very minute quantities. I mean, one billionth of a gram in a uh, quantity of several million other atoms and molecules, it's obviously very rare. But they are using the particle accelerator to create antimatter. And they will be building a linear accelerator in Japan specifically for the purpose of colliding matter and antimatter. And that's several years in the future that that machine will be operational. They haven't even broken ground for it. But they know that they can use antimatter in a similar fashion as they can use strangelets. It is a power source, and it can be used as a weapon. And the small quantities that have been produced in the laboratory at CERN and in other laboratories is 
kept in a suspended state within a magnetic bottle, very much like they portrayed in that movie, Angels and Demons. Wow, and I know the antimatter aspect of all of this is something that Joe has been looking into, and I want to be able to come back to that, Joe, because I'll build this as everything they don't want us to know about CERN. Now, a lot sure. of people so far will be thinking, well, there's nothing really we haven't covered so far, but this is where it goes a whole lot deeper, because we've got the rifts open, say, come December time, when the streams of lead are colliding. Now then, Tony there brought up Saturn and the fact that it is viewed as a prison planet for beings not on this dimension that can't really coexist here under these conditions. Hey, Kev, I, I wanted to bring up a Hollywood reference too, since you guys brought up um, angels and demons. Uh, I recently saw Thor for the first time. And it was very interesting, you know, you look at the ancient Viking legends of the Nine Realms and how they portrayed it there. It's very similar. You know how they talk about dimensions almost being like pages of a book? Um, that's kind of how they they portrayed it there in layers. It really you know? is. And sometimes, Joe, I actually tell my son to think about it as a book. And if you were sticking a pencil through it, now each page in that book isn't directly aware of all the number of layers above and below it's barely aware of the layer above and below because it knows no different and that's right. how i sometimes look at this multi-dimensional reality in my head doesn't make it right but let's just say there are beings stuck on saturn now one other interesting factor that we have uncovered and spoke about during our time covering cern is the fact that it's not just this kind of stuff that they've been playing about with this place has been about since the late 40s, early 50s, and they have been responsible for so many things. Now, one project that particle accelerators did play a huge part in is something called the human genome and the fact that they cracked it. Now, I suspect that one part of the story that hasn't really been told so far is what happens when this rift is opened up. But, Tony... When you factor in the human genome and a Dr. Craig Ventner, who was responsible for cracking it and publishing his own DNA online, a world first, amid huge controversy back in the 90s, then we can start to lay out just what is going to happen when that portal is maintained. And I think the best person to talk about this is you, because you were the first person that ever introduced me to something called a third strand of synthetic DNA. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and this is something that you can readily find on the Internet uh, in the scientific journals. Third strand of DNA, essentially the first generation of it, was a strand composed of, of silicon. It has evolved into actually... Uh, a composition of the found of the building blocks of actual DNA uh, into three strands, and initially the third strand was coated in nano thin coating of gold in order to impart digital information and programming upon it. But now they've actually moved to the point where they can grow two strand and three strand DNA from the raw building blocks and the proteins to create synthetic DNA. All you need are the four building block components and a software program. And there are college students throughout the world now that are using 3D printers to print new organisms using the foundational building blocks, the amino acids of DNA. And you know, Tony is not exaggerating here, Joe. I was listening to this Dr. Craig Ventner and he said basically all they needed at the start, all they had on the table was a Petri dish and four bottles of different chemicals. And from that, they created life. You want to talk about MacGyver, dude. I mean, that is about the MacGyver. That, that is MacGyver from... That's like, you know, jury rigging the, um, uh, you know, making explosives out of uh, duct tape and paper clips. That's kind of like what... It, it's that amazing... That they and they did this. What was it in the eighties? I want to say they first started 
uh, when they first um, claimed that they, you know, had cracked the human genome and all that kind of stuff. But w- what this, this is huge, man. Think about the implications of uh, this work. Let's just say, for example, now that they've got this, um, you know, these DNA, they can basically write DNA, synthesize DNA. That means that basically can't they print human bodies at this point? I mean, if that's the case, why not, right? Well, you see, let's not call it human because it isn't going to be human anymore. Thank you. Yeah, organism, synthetic organism. And that's exactly where we're going because I've posted a link in the chat room and this is from a presentation by Dr. Craig Ventner to NASA. Now, they dress it up as being for the potentials of utilizing this kind of stuff we're talking about here for the likes of space travel. You know, they show one small, I think it's a single-celled bacteria here on Earth, which basically it can shatter its DNA and it will replicate again all by itself. Now, he was speculating, well, what if we've done that for space travel? That totally negates all that radiation in space, right? He was talking about creating artificial, I don't even know if you call them humanoids, clones. I have no idea what you would call these, Joe. But they were engineering these things for space flight. And here's the thing, Tony, because I think we're going to wander into the land of speculation now. (laughs) And we're going to basically say that somewhere possibly there's a big warehouse full of skin suits waiting to go. For the very energies and entities that are currently trapped on a planet more commonly known as Saturn. And think about it, though. I mean, not only would it make a great storyline, but this is exactly what these people are all about. That's what it and And, and as far as I understand it, Tony, the um, I mean, this this would fit perfectly well. A la CERN, open up uh, rift income demons, inhabit said vessels. And Viola, we have the zombie apocalypse. And that's what I put in my second book, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough, is exactly See, that I knew I read because, that somewhere. Yep. <laughs> it, is, it is in the journals. Again, I try not to speculate. I connect dots from the scientific journals. And they have, since Dr. Ventner's um, public announcement, they have grown not only organs, but I am sure they have grown entire hu- hybrid, human hybrid bodies that are in stasis right now, in hibernation, that will form that army that I spoke of earlier that is awaiting the spiritual incarnation of these demonic entities. And you know, Now, this sounds really bizarre, but you have to look at what is the motive for creating hybrids that are devoid of intelligence and a spirit. It, they are vessels. They yes. are creating the vessels. And they have already created small organisms in public. But as we've talked about many times and other people, what we see is the tip of the iceberg of what is really going on in science. And the things that we see today are already 30 and 40 years, maybe even 50 years old the things that are coming out as new advances. So there is no reason to not believe that hybrids exist and are in a condition of stasis right now because if you can grow the organs, you can grow the body. Absolutely. Are you there? Yeah, oh, no, no, I'm right here. So if if that's the case, think about this as well, uh, Tony. This um, This is unbelievable. Not only can you do that, but then think about this. There are national DNA databases. As a matter of fact, um, I'm trying to pull up the, the site now that I was using. It's called the Forensics, the Forensic Genetics Policy Initiative. DNA Policy Initiative, uh, dot org is the website. And basically this is a lobbying group, uh, that says setting human rights standards for DNA databases worldwide. So according to them, there are 60 countries right now with DNA databases, the United States being one, of course, UK, Europe. But with these databases, who's to say that they just can't go ahead and 
print a doppelganger of you. And, um, you know, all of a sudden you're replaced and no one knows the difference. Exactly. I mean, what? Right. <laughs> it's crazy. Because picture it, picture it. We've talked about it, but picture it. If you have a software program that takes the A, T, G, and C, um, building blocks, the bases that then form the amino acids that then move out to become RNA and DNA and become the double and the triple helix, the triple strand of DNA, then you have the ability to design those chains of DNA, design those double and triple helix exactly the way you want it to be. There's no more mixing human and animal DNA to create chimera, like in the Bible, you now have the ability to start at the quantum level. And I want to go off, I'm going to give you a moment, but I want to go back to talking about the connection between CERN, Berkeley, particle accelerators, the Human Genome Project, and brain mapping. Unbelievable. I mean, this is, this is, Kev, let me tell you something, this is just unreal. And in hour number three, this is where it really gets... Crazy, and I don't, I don't oh, want to get. Can I take far. you crazy? Because I know we want to kill some time right before Tony goes into laying all that out. Because there's only a couple of minutes left, Joe. So everyone knows I love Clyde Lewis, a friend of Tony's. Let me go, Clyde, for you on just a couple of moments, Joe. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, we're talking yeah. about here the engineering of not humans, but some kind of beings. I was talking about making them able to self repair. In space. One other thing I seen on the list that he never really spoke about was the fact that they would make them hairless. Now, that obviously going to help with space travel, traveling about in the vacuum. You need things dead sterile up there. Joe, we speak about Battlestar Galactica. Wow. And you know how the. What a story. Maybe, maybe, maybe all those aeons and ages ago, there was a civilization here, and maybe for whatever reason, they left. And possibly, just possibly, what they done is, they done the same thing. And they engineered a being, hairless, able to travel through space, probably made it small, looking like myself. Probably we would call it the Greys. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the other thing, too, is um, um, the Battlestar Galactica line would mean that, you know, human beings basically go through this cycle every X, you know, thousands of years or whatever. Did I can they call them cyclones for that cyclones, reason? Cyclones, just cyclones. saying. I mean, it's it's just unbelievable, you know. That, but but again, it's all to me. It's all plausible. It's inc- it's incredibly plausible. But what's going to get even more incredible after the break is not only do we have Anthony Patch, we're going to bring in Melissa and possibly Aaron Dykes as well, and they've been doing extensive research on all of this, and it ties in perfectly with what Tony was talking there about mind mapping various other accelerators and this folks this is the stuff that CERN don't want you to know about stay tuned there's one more hour to go we'll be there on the other side or like Schrodinger's cat will we stay tuned to find out we're there real people real radio initiating the truth frequency this is truth frequency radio to the hour number two. I show you, Brad. Tell you what, this is great. I'm going to start my own super symmetry, Joe. We were entangled there across the pond. (laughs) I'm going to start my own (laughs) podcast. I've had I've had it up to here. All this hijacking. I mean, what is this? It, what is this, terrorist radio, frequency radio? Is that what this is, TFR? Oh, come on, you love it when Quantum <laughs> Kev comes to town or doesn't. Are you does kidding he? me, dude? This has been a, the most delightful experience. And and uh, you know what makes it really good? What really is the icing on the cake is that, you know, Tony Patch is back. And that's what really is, is so important is that, you know, we're able to advance this. Because this is really where all the action is. I mean, let's be honest, Kev, you and, know? Exactly, Joan. Come on, you can tell the listeners... You can share with them my delight and my excitement when the big man got in touch with me again because uh, I have been profoundly affected in a good way ever since I came across this guy and I haven't been able to hide my delight. I'm sitting here smiling. My cheeks are sore. Kid, kid in a candy store. Kid in a candy store. So now we, we have gone. Um, we're boldly going where no uh, 
No one's gone before. That's right. We're, we're heading into that territory. We're talking about like chimeras now being printed <laughs> uh, on this planet, you know, being grown, if you will, hybrids. Well, Joe, can I just jump in for one moment before you go? Because I'm pretty sure not many people will make it to the end of Dr. Craig Bentner's presentation. Oh, but it ties in perfectly just, with what you're talking about just here. Just because- watch the first three minutes. That's all you got to do. If, if, if you watch anything else, just watch the first three minutes. The first three minutes will hook you. So if you're not hooked in the first three minutes, then there's something wrong. That's okay. all I'm going to say. Because what he says is just, is just jaw-dropping. And did you catch the part at the end where they were dealing almost with the morality issues and the ethical implications of this? And they hinted at the fact that, well, if you were to do this kind of thing in space, do we have those problems? Just saying. Oh, I mean, you're absolutely right, Kev. So, I mean, this is just this is unbelievable. And I mean, when you're when you're talking about the creation of, you know, these uh, hybrids or or these uh, chimera, whatever you want to call them, Tony. Um, don't mm-hmm. you, at this point, at this point, we're just throwing ethics out the door. I mean, really, I, w- where is there room for yeah. ethics at this point? There is none because we're dealing with a purely demonic driven agenda and there are no ethics in the demonic world. No, you're, you're right. See, that's why I, I, I quickly became disenchanted with politics. I mean, I still follow it. Don't get me wrong. You know, we, Kev and I sometimes have to fall on our swords and go ahead and cover that stuff sometimes. But um, what you learn is that it's all corrupt. Everything is corrupt. So how can you expect there to be any ethical behavior? It's, it's kind of like, you know, the Supreme Court here, Kev, says equal justice under the law. Yeah, right. W- where? Where does that exist? So conversely, uh, where would it exist here? You know, here we have these scientists that are doing things and how it's almost an oxymoron for them to say, well, we're doing it ethically. Are you kidding me? How do you do this ethically and expect it not to be abused? I, I just don't get it. Well, still in the hands yeah, of the lunatics, it can't and... be done, Joe. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, I. No, I'm in agreement with you. I don't have any personal, um, you know, negative, uh, I don't want to say, you know, I I don't want to slander anyone in that sense of saying that, you know, I have ill will against these people. I think they're delusional. I think that they've been deceived. I think they've been led down the garden path and enticed with, you know, money and fame and pure research and, you know, unlimited budgets to work with. So I think they've been, you know, falling under this grand delusion and this this thought that they're doing something that is good for humanity, that is going to lead to um, everlasting life, that they are looking at the threshold of immortality for the human race, and right. therefore it is worth pursuing at any cost. I, yeah, yeah, the road to hell is paved by good intentions, and I mean, it, it, it is every single time it Boy, does that bear! It's all—it's always true. It seems to always be true. Um, and again, this—this this is not outside the realm of possibility, folks. This is very uh, real. <laughs> and if you put two and two together, here you have a particle accelerator like CERN that's able to rip the veil, if you will. I, I find it interesting, Tony, that the September dates are always coming up, but. You know, we looked at September being a convergence, but it was almost too good to be true, to be honest with you. And when you look at the right. schedule of CERN, that September date doesn't marry up to what CERN Agreed. is actually doing, right? So so would you say that a lot of people are deceived? I, I would assume that, you know, if nothing happens, which I assume and I, I believe we're going to make it through the next couple of days, um that the real action really is going to be closer into the December, November, December time frame, would you say? Yes, I would say so, if we are to believe their schedule. Now, it's a public schedule, so it calls into question its veracity, because they're Uh not going to tell us in writing exactly what they're doing. So there's always that window of opportunity for them to do something completely unannounced. Unethical? Unethical, would you? (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to go yes. in. Now. <laughs> yeah. So... I, I mean, let, let me do is, this. Let me take. Go ahead, finish your thought. Well, no, I, I was just going to throw it to you because. Um, well, where do you want to go from here? Glad you said that, Joe. Because well, if you like derailed the show, I'd like I would real... whoop you. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Let, let's make it tangible for the audience because you know we can do speculation and we can connect dots. But let's take, for example the hard science that's going on at CERN and take it down to a smaller machine, which is at Berkeley, just like we talked about Brookhaven being a particle accelerator. At Berkeley, there's housed in what is known as the Advanced Light Source Building. We've talked about this before as well, but it's a small ring-shaped particle accelerator, just like CERN. It's One of its many uses is to generate extremely powerful X-rays and they do what is known as X, X-ray crystallography. That is photo, photography using X-rays, if you will. This goes to DNA. This is how they were able to discover the building blocks of DNA beyond the mere structure of the double helix and triple helix. They were actually able to go down to the quantum level and through what's called um, X-ray interference, or in, in, inference, I should say, inference, they're able to measure using crystals. And again, here are my nano diamonds that I talk about in my books. Using crystals to actually focus and take photographs. And I'm being euphemistic in saying photographs, but take images through measuring the changes in X-ray wavelength and direction of these X-rays as they move through the three-dimensional space of a crystal structure. The point of this is they are able to look at the building blocks of DNA using X-rays that are generated by a particle accelerator and then be able to say, okay, we can start from scratch at the quantum level and we can create a hybrid human body. Now we take that from Berkeley and take it to CERN, Switzerland, bigger scale. You're able to do exactly the same thing because Berkeley, like New York's Brookhaven Lab, these are all proof-of-concept laboratories. On a small scale, they prove it, they transfer it to Geneva, Switzerland, and they put it together in a larger scale for bigger applications. And so here's, here's the thing, Tony, because When we talk here's... about DNA, we're talking about particle accelerators. Exactly, and here's the connection to this Dr. Craig Ventner, because when he started doing his research, even the mainstream and the governments and things thought it was a bit far out, thought he couldn't do it. However, after he started to demonstrate that this was doable, one of the main people who were funding him were the Department of Energy and the National Institute of Health. Now, anyone who listens to Mm -hmm. this show and the Freedom Link, and when Melissa is on talking about this kind of thing, those two organizations will probably ring a bell with you because, Tony, the Department of Energy are very, very interested when it comes to likes of, oh, underground bases and (laughs) particle accelerators and all the stuff we're talking about. Right. You You know, when I first looked at... See, I went to UC Berkeley, and when I first looked back at this and I said... What in the world does a particle accelerator have to do with human DNA? And why is the Department of Energy involved in essentially a health project? Well, I just laid out the connection for you there. The Department of Energy funds the machines that allow them to create artificial DNA to create artificial bodies. Boom, we're done. And you know what's even more boom wow about this, Joe? if you factor in this synthetic third strand of DNA, now, yeah. they can do whatever the heck they like with this. It can be a super soldier type being. doesn't matter. But one thing that ties back to the machine, as we are calling it, at the heart of CERN, is the fact that because it's got that third strand of synthetic DNA made up of what? Cubits. Little nano diamonds. Well... How about you entangle them with some of the qubits, 
housed in the machine. Instant learning, all from the AI via a quantum computer. Instantaneous. That's right. We talked about the computer before and its equivalency. The model that they released, the model of the computer, its model number released in February of this year is 2048. Their first model that I encountered with them was the 512, became the 1024, became the 2048. All of that's in my books. This has to do with a computer that now has, by the manufacturer's own press release, the equivalent processing power of 7 billion human brains. To put that in context, the most powerful supercomputer that is transistor-based in the world is a Tiani 2 in China. They put the two computers years ago. This isn't even the 2048. This was the 512 model. Put the two head-to-head with a problem. The Quanta, the, the qubit-based computer solved the problem in 10 seconds. It took 30 minutes for the transistor-based computer to solve the problem. This is the kind of thing that we're talking about. That's a snapshot. It goes wow. way beyond that. It goes into modeling human behavior, but it will control the computer, not only control CERN and the portal, it will control every human mind on the planet. That's unbelievable. So, so, and now how does it go about controlling every single mind on the planet? Very simple. Electromagnetic energy, be it microwaves or any other um, frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum, you can do this. We've heard of the cell towers. We've heard of mm-hmm. uh, geosynchronous satellites in space, bouncing signals, generating signals. We now have within our bodies, thanks to the chemical spraying of the atmosphere, nanoparticles in our bodies that are laying dormant, which will be triggered by an electromagnetic signal, and then it will begin transforming our DNA, and from within we will transform, and we will be controlled by this computer electronically, by remote control. Wow. And, and so, I just was there was a movie once, or just recently, I think it was. Uh, it had to do with cell phones. You know, cell phones uh, being um, everybody has one, and it was the catalyst, basically, almost like part of a binary system to bring about this mind control apparatus. But you know, they really don't need that at this point. I I, I wouldn't think to where. You'd have it nope. right there it, because it's already there. I mean, oh boy, this has a lot of very dismal consequences. I, I'd say, and um, how do you go about? Is there any way to protect yourself from it, Tony? Well, uh, I try not to be a preacher and get too much into you know my religious beliefs, but I will say mm-hmm. I'm a Christian. I believe that I have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit provides protection even at the physical DNA level, and people can take it from there, from however they want to approach it. I gotcha. I like that method. That's pretty good. Exactly what I was saying to you the other night, Joe, and that's why yourself, Rebecca, Angela, Tony, in particular have resonated with me, and if somebody five, ten years ago had said I'd be able to have a conversation about spiritual things and more Christian aspects of life, I probably would have laughed, but that's because I was used to the stereotypical, air quotes, Christian, that yeah. would throw it in your face, and it was refreshing. Now, it doesn't mean I have to buy into all of it, but I appreciate all of it, I try to be more tuned to it, and everyone out there, all we're trying to say is, and we harp on about this, it's just a demonstration of how we all have different opinions, but we still have to come together and work together. That's right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a common foe. You know, even even here in the United States, the founding fathers, hell, some of them were bitter enemies, to be honest with you. But you know what? They all banded together. They said, hell, the, you know, the fight, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So guess what? <laughs> we're going to go take care of business. And after that, after the dust settles, 
we'll uh, we'll work out our differences then. You know, Kev. So uh, that's kind of how we have to work it now. It's people don't understand just how uh, how close we are to destruction. You know, Shiva, if you will, Kev. Exactly, and that ties directly back into the CERN. And something I want to ask Tony about, maybe he wants to speak to, to that actual statue of Shiva. But something we've covered on the show a lot is the AI in the world right now. And I'm wondering, Tony, when it comes to these quantum computers, are they basically run by AI? Is there a lot of human input in that? What kind of system are we looking at here? Does a guy sit in front of the monitor? Well, prior to the Model 2048 computer, we did not have AI in this this, qubit-based computer, this quantum computer that is not based on transistors. With the advent of the Model 2048, we do now have an artificially intelligent computer. Is it sentient? No, I do not believe it is. However... Back in 2010, the manufacturer on their website promoted the fact that when the computer that was due to be released in February of 2015, and they didn't cite the model number at that time, they promoted the fact that it would be artificially intelligent. So yes, we now have a computer that is live in the sense of being artificially intelligent, and it can learn on its own and it can come up with solutions on its own, and it can operate independently, not sentient, not self-aware, and certainly not in possession of a spirit or a soul. But I do believe that it will be the mark of the beast system, and it will be under the direct control of Satan if if it is not already under the direct control of Satan. But it is certainly artificially intelligent. If we actually think about it, what we've been describing tonight negates the need for an artificial intelligence because that intelligence, that energy, the darkness will in itself be housed in these synthetic beings that are currently being produced. And if people don't think they're producing these, Joe, look at the fact that they can reproduce the woolly mammoth they yeah. reanimate viruses that have wiped out billions in the past. We're dealing but with a death cult. Earlier you brought up mind mapping, you know. Um, mm-hmm. if, if if that's the case, uh, th- then why not just, you know, transfer a brain into an artificial one? I mean, Tony, I mean, that's pretty, I would say that's real, right? Not, voila, immortality, if you will, just print a new body. I'm good to go. Mm-hmm. You know? There, there's the whole transhumanist movement, and the transhumanist movement has typically been the merging of man and machine and the uploading of your consciousness into a computer. And it's actually moved beyond that. Transhumanism is a uh, stopgap measure. It's a, it's a stepping stone. Now you do not need a computer in the sense of a machine to upload your consciousness into. The machine is organic. The brain has already been mapped. They're just talking about, oh, we're going to map the brain and all. It's already been done. We just don't know about it in the public venue. Same way the Human Genome Project was done, they now have a map of the neural pathways of the human brain and all of its different configurations between people. They will be uploading, that's their goal, is to upload the consciousness of the elite, of the select, that want immortality, and they will be uploading their consciousness not into a computer, but into a hybrid brain. And until they've sussed out, they're going to be downloading the entities that these people, Joe, seem to serve age upon age. Yeah. it's It, it certainly does make for a, a very exciting times, Kev. That's for sure. And my thing is, I think they're a lot closer to this technology. Have you noticed, though, that it seems like they haven't quite mastered it yet? Hence, why then does Mr. Rockefeller have to go for his fifth heart transplant at the age of 99? You know what I mean? 
Exactly, and we've got the people like Ray Kurzweil at Google. Right. He's heavy into this whole uploading of the consciousness. I believe even one of the outsiders, he's independents, running for election in 2016, is running for something called the Transhumanist Party. This is a definite push right, right now. And this takes us to somebody like Dr. Eric Pianca and things like that when we've heard him talking about the population of the planet being eradicated by use of deadly viruses and all his cult of followers clapping and cheering and crying as he talks about the end of the human race. But here we are, Tony. It won't be the end for them if they suss out this transference of the soul. Although there is no way, in my opinion, you can put a soul into a machine. But what do you think? Well, the soul and the consciousness are two separate things as I view it. Um, your consciousness, in theory, if it's purely a matter of mapping the mind and then reproducing that map within an artificial brain, a, uh, a brain that has been grown from DNA, you could theoretically, through digital programming, place those memories from one brain into an artificial brain, but it would be devoid of a spirit and devoid of a soul. It would simply be housing digital information. And this is similar to the language that you will hear Dr. Craig Ventner using because he talks about taking things from the digital world and then reproducing them here in the physical world in yeah. biological entities, Joe, from a it's computer a into life. It's it's almost like a version of like an analog to digital converter, if you will. Where you only take the it, other way, right? You go only, digital only, to analog. Only the other way, right? You go in digital to analog, or how, you know, however it is. But it's that converter, you know, that mm -hmm. and it's converting that uh, biological, you know, that DNA sequence into your ones and your zeros. So yeah, I mean, now that they've got that down to a <clears throat> science, eh, but the possibilities are endless here, Kev. You know. Feasibly, these hybrids that they're making, yeah, they could be the very cream of the crop. Yeah, the this this takes eugenics to a whole new level. It definitely but, does, and we have to ask ourselves: Are we walking past beings in the street that aren't as human as us? Are they, in the opinion of the dark scientists here, Joe, are they more human than us? Are they better humans, or this perhaps? Is it they live? Oh, it could very well be. Oh, Joe, my head's br it's bursting. Yep. If, if we step back just a moment, again, I mentioned this briefly a little while ago. There are college students around the world that are using 3D printers to actually grow new organisms that have never been seen in nature before. There are competitions going on in colleges to come up with the most novel, sustainable organism that is purely artificial in the sense that it did not exist as a naturally occurring form of DNA, but artificial DNA. So if they're allowing kids to play around with 3D printers and the like to create these organisms, you know that they're well advanced to the level of creating hybrid bodies, and they have done that for years. Wow, and Joe, we're just about going to the break. We've got one more section. We're going to get Tony to wrap everything up with a bow on, put anything out there he wants to get out. But, you know, we're listening to all of this, and I'm still thinking about these greys. I've seen in the chat room somebody shouting about the Nazis engineering the greys. It sounds crazy, right? But isn't reality far, far stranger than fiction it, ever can be? It is, and I've heard that too. That they were test pilots, Nazi test pilots, uh, like Joseph Mengele experiments or whatever. But And if you check out Melissa Melton, she's got a book which tells you it was something to do with Joseph Stalin. Paper oh, yeah, that's going right. the yeah. other way. And for anyone who's interested, the transhumanist running for election got his name thanks to Nano Girl, Zoltan Istvan, transhumanist 2016. What a great presidential name. election. And he's all got his own hair. Join us on the other side as we go back through the sun. Real people, real radio. Wherever you are, make it TFR. The Truth Frequency Radio. To what is unfortunately the final segment of what has been a fantastic 
KBS X, and that X means I've hijacked the Freedom Link yet again. This is becoming an all too regular occurrence. And again, before we launch back into this and provide advice, solutions, thoughts, and ideas, something we set out to do in this broadcast initially and remove a lot of the fear, is Joe, I have to thank you yet again, sir, because here we are. This is becoming a habit, man. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But, I mean, it's good habit, man, because the, the the information that we're getting out there, I mean, you just can't get this anywhere else. Come on, baby. You know how it is. And, I mean, having Quantum Kev, all of a sudden, it's like you show up out of nowhere and you're everywhere at the same time. How the hell can I even compete with that? Can you remember, can you remember like, a few weeks before the London Olympics – you were badgering me to finally move my ass and come on as, like, some kind of guest, and I just wasn't having it. And now look what three years or so can do, Joe. Bet you wish you'd never bothered. Oh, yeah, dude. No, this is perfect. I would never bother. Yeah, right. But listen, people are not here to listen to myself or Joe tonight. We are honoured and privileged to be joined by the man himself, after a forced silence, Mr. Anthony Patch is back. He's speaking publicly here, live, exclusively, first on The Kev Baker Show, in association with the Freedom Link. And that's because over the past months, we did work, work up such a really, really good, kind of geeky relationship between all of us hosts here on the network and Tony. Now, Tony, we set out in this broadcast to remove the hype and the fear, something that TFR holds really, really closely to its heart. It's what we try and live by here. Sometimes I hype things, I admit that, but that's where I go, and I try and say it's speculation, but we have an expert in you here tonight. So we have one segment left, sir. A, thank you for being brave and coming back to public speaking again on this, the most critical of subjects at this time. And B, where do we go from here? How do we take that last bit of fear away? And what can people do, Tony? Well, I'm going to speak for myself because I can't tell anyone else how to live their life or what they should or shouldn't do. But for me, my way of dealing with this was to turn to God and to ask him for guidance. That's still a small voice to listen to. And whether or not I should go public again with this, or whether I should have even started doing what I'm doing. And it's not about me. It's about the message I think he wants me to pass on, is that we have a very simple choice in life. We can either go to the dark, or we can go to the light. And you can define God, or the Creator, or have any belief system you want. But for me, my belief is in Jesus Christ and in the imparting of the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned. And for me, that's where I take my comfort and I believe my protection is the Holy Spirit protecting me and, if we need to, speak on the science level, protecting my DNA. And that's where I would suggest, maybe even plead, that people begin to think in those terms that this is real science, this is really going on, this machine really exists and the agenda is right in front of us as to what they're doing with the machine. And for that protection, I would turn to God. And that would be my way of saying that's how you remove the fear from the equation. I, I have to agree with you, Tony. As a matter of fact, you know, it's been, well, for a long time now, the powers that shouldn't be have really put into motion a... Um, systematic removal of God from society. And um, so, you know, it, it stands to reason, it stands to reason that, you know, now we have a, a population that, that for the most part is very disconnected spiritually and doesn't have that um, foundation, that faith to be able to fall, fall back on. So consequently, you know, a lot of them choose to go to the power structure, you know, to, uh, you know, government or whatever for that, for their sustenance, if you will. And mm -hmm. it's had a profound effect on society, albeit very negative, if you ask me, but also on um, the science community as well, because really at the, at, 
when you look at it, we really do have a, a I don't know if you want to like a a tech a, a technocratic technocratic dictatorship almost, you know, where these scientists can just basically go carte blanche and no one knows anything. No one says anything. They just go about, they do what they want to do. There's no checks and balances. And um, to me, that's a problem. What they'll say is there can't be any checks and balances because if there was, why, then we would never get anywhere. We would just all be haggling all the time and bickering over this is dangerous or that's going to kill or that's going to destroy the world. You know, so uh, what else do you have to fall back on but faith at this point? I agree with you, and, you know, they're somewhat of a priest to it. I, yeah. Again, I'll say it, I, I, feel, I feel for these people because I believe they have fallen for the grand and original deception, the promise of immortality by Satan in the Garden of Eden. And, you know, it may sound old-fashioned, but it really boils down to something as simple as that, that they have been deceived. I feel sorry for them. I pray mm. for them, for their souls, for their salvation. And I really do believe that they have fallen victim to this enormous system that you're describing. Absolutely. Think about this as well, folks, as, you know, as, as we conclude tonight. Even if what we're saying isn't true, what you're seeing in the mainstream media now speaks to this, albeit remotely. And that's that, like, for example, one of the headlines on Drudge tonight was, the Target is now testing robots for actual jobs in Target stores. So slowly but surely, human labor is being phased out. Well, what happens when people can't make a wage in this capitalistic system that we have here? Well, that that system is going to end up collapsing. And then what what are you going to have in its place? You see, that's the problem is you're going to have a bunch of useless eaters at that point, which is what they call us. And what are they going to do with useless eaters? Well, there's that those stone monuments over in Georgia, the Georgia Guidestones, that basically tell you what the plan is. And that's to bring the Earth's population down to a very manageable 500 million people. And that's just unbelievable, Tony, when you think about it, because there's no, they don't hide their the, the plan. The plan's out there in broad daylight. As a matter of fact, I think the Pope is going to be here at the UN to speak about this here soon about this new agenda that is going to take us into the next age by God. No. And, and the, the fact is they make no bones about it. They are not hiding this stuff. So I would say it would behoove people. Yeah. I I would say behoove people, Tony, to take it seriously. Wouldn't you say? I would say so, and it's unfortunate. You know, we do have the distraction of cell phones and mass media and football and baseball, basketball, all of these distractions to keep people from looking at the things that we are seeing and that we see so clearly and so plainly right in front of us. And if people would remove those distractions and go and do some very simple basic research on their own and check out what we've been talking about, they'll quickly realize that we're not full of hot air or anything else, and that we are speaking the truth as to what's going on in the priesthood of science. And in the priesthood, they hold all of the information secret, and they have their own arcane language in the form of physics. And it has been my mission to be a translator of that arcane physics to the lay people so that they understand what the priesthood within the world of physics is really up to. So I got a question for you, Tony. Do you think secretly they all wear fish hats and worship Dagon? Come on. You could tell me. <laughs> well, the Vatican certainly likes that fashion. Well, you and know. It is okay. the ancient god of Dagon. Oh, and sure. isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And isn't it? Isn't it interesting, too? Okay. So this is another parallel that I drew since, I mean, we'll just go way off the deep end. So I guess that there's a Jesuit that's going to be taking over operations over at CERN from what I hear. And Mm -hmm. isn't that interesting that at the same time on Mount Graham, there's a Jesuit operating the most powerful telescope on earth 
with the Lucifer device there looking out into space. So you got that going on at the same time. You got CERN firing up at the same time. You know, they're probably going to rip a hole, bring these entities through to populate these human bodies that, by the way, they came out and publicly said, you know, J. Craig Venter, hey, this is what we're doing. We can do this. Empty vessels. So they're, they're looking out there for these things or they're looking somewhere. They've got their gateway. Uh, they've got some vessels now with their hybrids. I mean, what? It's, it's unbelievable. So even if you don't believe in the, uh, uh, conspiracy theorist version of this, look at the, the non conspiracy theorist version of this. Whereas in 20 years, robots will basically have phased out human labor. Okay. Then what? So either way you go down, this is a serious situation and it's one in which humanity has never seen itself, at least in this age, if you will, post flood, mm-hmm. just an amazing, amazing thing. And 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 again, I can't say it enough. And Tony, you said it best. It, it, you have to have faith. That's the only thing. You can't fear this stuff. You can't fear death. Death is nothing but just a a passing on, if you will. That's why they call it. Hey, he passed on. You know. Of course, you could be like a nihilist, too, and not really care about it. (laughs) There are two sides of every coin, I guess. (laughs) Although this is probably like one of those. This is probably like one of those D20 dice. You remember from the old Dungeons and Dragons? (laughs) It's probably that 20 sided. It's unbelievable. Kev, Kev, are are you following all this, Kev? I am, man. I'm just taking the back seat. I hog enough airtime as it is. People have got Kev Baker overload. And, you know, being a listener all these years, this is gold, this conversation right here. And for people who aren't of this religious, spiritual kind of background or thinking, you've got to bear in mind the enemy that we face. Nobody can deny that they worship the Dark One. We're looking at the Pope going to the UN. I suspect he'll take a sneaky helicopter ride up to his Lucifer device. Don't be surprised if he's peering through that thing on the same day that CERN celebrate their year of light. Light? Lucifer. You don't get coincidences, Joe. And again, you know, here I was. I was watching that movie Thor, and I was looking at, you know, their little gateway that they go that makes the wormhole, or they said traveling on the rainbow, or whatever they called it. And basically, I was like, "Wow, that looks a lot like the Lucifer device." (laughs) Dog, what? Wait a minute, and that was built where on a Stargate, an ancient Stargate? Hey, oh my gosh! Again, another parallel. I was like, "Oh boy, it's another movie." You know, the list is growing, Kev. It just is. It's unbelievable. But this is, all, all these parallels are not by chance. They don't call these things programs for accident. It's for a reason. They're literally programming us. And some people will tell you that this revelation of the method, we see all these things coming out in the shows, it's like predictive programming. Well, there's a magical aspect to that as well. And it's the fact that they have to show us what they are doing in some kind of sick, occult, magical twist. Talking about magicians now, again, you have to understand where these people come from. And they're dealing with knowledge that was occulted way back at the times of these Egyptian mystery schools. And then over the ages, it was passed down through the secret societies. And here we are today. And look at the secret societies and how their symbology and their connections to the organizations like NASA skull and bones to the CIA, things like that. It is everywhere to be seen. And then look at how all these organizations, Joe, are the very ones who fund the films and put it in our faces. Absolutely. Dink. And, and, and Tony, I mean, let's be real. The, the pockets are very deep, are they not? They are. And, you know, we've heard the trite phrase, follow the money. Well, it's pretty tough to follow the money in this case because it leads into a black underworld budget. There really is no budget for CERN. They can have as much money as they ask for or require, and it is probably what has been draining the economies of the world 
and causing this economic upheaval that's been going on is the funneling of money towards this machine. Wow, could very well be. I remember some speeches back in the um, early 90s of George H.W. Bush at the um, that super uh, collider down in Texas when they were actually they were in the process of building it. And just how right. almost, um, I mean, driven is an understatement when I can, when I say how motivated he was to build it and how he was talking about how we could travel back to the very edge of the universe, you know, how they could, this machine will allow like he, them to do it. He put it out in the open, Tony. Mm-hmm. He sure did. He sure did. And he didn't have the first clue from a science standpoint what he was even talking about how it was going to be done. But he was there as the face and the mouthpiece to promote it. And the reason that they shut that down is not necessarily economics. It was simply a matter of where did the abyss, the key to the abyss, actually reside. And they pinpointed it to Geneva, Switzerland, to the ancient Roman temple, and therefore, they canceled the project in Texas because Texas was not the key to the abyss. Okay, and Tony, I'm glad you brought that up because that was kind of an off-air chat. And unfortunately, poor Melissa Melton is absolutely dying with a migraine right now, Joe. And this yeah. was one of the things that she wanted to bring up. And it's something that we've covered on your show and mine as well. And that's this potential collider in Texas. Now, Tony, we've spoke about this on the shows, but you've got some first-hand information on the character who was speaking out and saying that they've got one of these super colliders in Texas, and a lot of this is to do with the production of dark matter. What's the truth about that? Yeah, dark matter is only theoretical. Uh, it has never been proven. Again, in the... Um, criteria that I've laid out, measurable and reproducible, never been, never met that criteria. Uh, there is no activity going on in Texas. The gentleman that we spoke off the air about, I've had personal conversations with many times over the phone, and I know that he is a disinformation person. So there is nothing going on in Texas that is even closely associated to a particle accelerator or the production of dark matter. It's only the activities at CERN that the world is focused on. All their eggs are in one basket. And, Tony, we've got less than 10 minutes left. Is there absolutely anything at all that you need to touch on before we let you go and we let the listeners try and digest all of this brilliant information? Well... It's interesting. I'm focusing at this point on more research in the area of DNA. Uh, CERN, I've pretty much exhausted. I have a pretty good handle on what they're doing as far as I can go with my ability to go down rabbit holes. Uh, it is DNA that is of most concern to me right now. Um, it's tied to the electric universe. I've been trying to determine if anyone has figured out what causes the shape of DNA. What causes the double and triple well, helix? Tony, can I just place? put it to you that it looks very strikingly similar to something we mentioned earlier on and something that they're trying to create via CERN, and that's something we see as above, so below again, Birkeland currents. Would you agree? Exactly. You hit it right on the head, my friend. The Birkeland currents, which are, um, you'll see them through the help Hubble telescope photographs, you'll see them in the laboratory. They are a twisted helical strand of two electrical currents. And I do believe, because everything, as I said in the beginning of the show, is electrically connected, I believe that the helix, the shape of it, is generated by Birkeland currents at the molecular level. And I have as yet to find any scientist who has publicly put out in a white paper or anything else, that they have been able to make that connection between as above, so below, that connection of the Birkeland currents at a quantum level initiates the twisting 
of the double and triple strand helix. And I think there is an entanglement there. And if you do carry on this as above, so below. If you think of us, look at us. We grow out of that cord contained in that double helix. What if this consciousness, this conscious universe that we find ourselves in, this multiverse, what if it too is growing out of just pure code? You can call that source code. Others may call it the God code. But I think there is a correlation here, Tony, and I don't think there's any coinkydink between the fact that our helix looks very, very similar to those twisted pair currents we see above. Absolutely. And yes, God works in codes. God works in mathematics, and everything is mathematically constructed. So yes, you can be on the macro or the micro scale, and it will be the same. You and I'm pretty sure... At- I'm pretty sure, Tony, there's even scientific papers out there that hint that even our DNA right now, as it is, they laughably call it maybe 96% junk. However, even the most academic of scientists are starting to look at the fact it may have interdimensional quantum properties. That's Mm. right, isn't it? Yes, most definitely. And I believe that through the DNA we have... um, generational memories embedded in our DNA that's carried on from our ancestors. I'm not talking about evolution. I'm just talking about inherent traits and personalities and memories that are imparted into our DNA and carried forward. Oh, no, there's no doubt about that. I mean, if you, you know, if you're a parent, uh, you end up kind of seeing that happen, you know, or even if you look back, you know, a couple generations back, you'll see striking similarities if you get to know your great grandparents or, or anything like that. Um, I think that that's extremely evident, uh, Tony. That there's some sort of memory that's built into it. Um, but you know, you look at you, you get you said it best. Math, the golden ratio. Look at how many things uh, the golden ratio. Uh, it, it's built into just about everything. Uh, that is almost like a mathematical fingerprint. Of a creator, and I think what is it? Quantum physics? What is this? A hologram, Kev? Isn't that basically like we're on the holodeck? Well, there is some theories out there, and they're not new. They're quite old theories that all of this right. could well be a hologram. It's just interesting, you know, when you when you put things in perspective. But when Tony summed it there, he hit it there because source code, God code, everything is mathematics and physics. And it doesn't surprise me that when you boil it right down and you start looking at the very fabric that everything is built on, we have to kind of relate it to something we know. Maybe that's just the closest representation we can actually comprehend, Joe. Might be nothing like a hologram, but that's that's the the closest that we can recognize. And Well, you know, to put it in perspective, it's, it's almost like, you know, life experience. Either you have it or you don't. And if you don't have that frame of reference, Tony, it's very hard to conceptualize or visualize something. It's a, it's almost telling somebody who's been blind their whole life, Tony, to uh, describe the color red. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you do that? Well, you can't. Yeah, and and all of that generational memory that we have, think of the hybrids that are artificially grown from the basic building blocks, the amino acids of DNA and into proteins and protein folding, they don't have that generational memory. And I think that the generational memory contributes a lot to our sense of morals and our sense of the spiritual and our sense of God. And therefore, they have no morals and no sense of God and are truly separated from God. So they have no awareness of God because they don't have that that, that genetic DNA memory that's passed on to us. And I think we're living at a time when we spoke of 2012, possibly big changes, paradigm shifts. Do I think the energy that we're entering in the galaxy right now, as a galaxy, as we fly through the universe, potentially, possibly, we could be looking at the light coming from the sun and reactivating the 96% junk. Maybe even 2% of that junk would be enough to take us to telepathy and beyond. Who knows? I always get asked, though, you know, how the heck do people know that we're not using 96% or... Well, this is getting as bad as Griff's dollar. 
You know what I mean? It it, it, it is. It's it's like uh, who the heck who determines that? You Dr. know, how do you Craig know what Ventner. He actually measured it with nanobots, dude. He knows how big it is. Ah, <laughs> oh, but the capability, I mean, come on, it's like the flux capacitor. You just don't really know the true capability of it. But I tell you, you what, know? we also will never know the true capabilities of one man who has shared three hours of his time with us tonight. Tell me about it. What a fantastic night tonight, wasn't it, Kev? Absolutely. I am blown away. I'm honoured and privileged to have this guy on any time. And Anthony, if you could give your website one last shout out before you go, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I always have a blast with you guys. It's, this is the most fun I ever have. And Tony, we well, even talk about yeah, balls last, in our yeah. emails and get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's got the listeners wondering what's your website, man? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. It's Anthony Patch. P A T T A. AnthonyPatch dot com. And if you'd be kind enough to purchase my books, I would love it. It'll keep me going and doing the things that I'm doing now. Trust me, folks. I've read these books. Great stuff. It's been an honour and a privilege to be on TFR with you tonight and wherever you are. Keep it TFR. <laughs>